when it comes to marriage, I've had to learn a lot of things. And it's a lot of it's based on mistakes that Lisa and I made in our life, okay? And some people assume because you're a pastor, then your marriage is better than everybody else's, but it's not. I mean, there's there was a time when we looked at each other and said divorce, okay? And it, it, was, it was hard, okay? But God was faithful. God kept us together. And God... I know God worked in her and God worked in me and helped me understand my responsibility and her responsibility. And just very quickly, um, let's go to Ephesians 5. If you, We're all going to get our electronic Bibles here. And um, I like this because anytime you need help, you got it in your pocket. It's right there. So Ephesians 5 is a really good place when it comes to marriage. And I'm going to explain what I think are some misunderstandings that people have about the roles and about what he said. So he said in Ephesians 5, uh, let's see here, verse 22, wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Okay, so the wife Everybody has to be under some kind of authority. Everybody does. I'm under authority. There's things over me, okay? And there are situations in this church where the bylaws could be brought in and I could be put out as pastor. That's an authority over me, okay? So everybody has it. And because I love this church so much, I want to do right by it. I want to be a benefit to it. I want to be a blessing. I want this church, if something happens, God calls me somewhere else or I die or whatever, I want this church in better shape than it was when I first got it because it was in bad shape. And so I, the authority that's over me, I don't despise it. I embrace it because I know where authority is, there's protection. Okay, so you know that if somebody put their hand on you and Brian saw it, he's going to go into action. Absolutely. Okay, so wives submitting your uh, wives submitting unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And then it says, verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he's the savior of the body. So therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. So now here's what this isn't. Marriage and the man being the head of the family is never a dictatorship. Never, 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 never. And I know marriages. I've seen them in our church of guys who took this idea that it, they are absolute, the absolute final authority on everything, and they don't have to listen to their wife and family if they don't want to, and that's not right. So here's my head. When my body, which is, let's say it's my wife and family, if my body needs air, it comes from the head. I'm the one responsible for giving life to my family. If my family, my wife needs sight, that's in the head too. If my family and my wife need nourishment, that comes from the head. If my family and my wife just need hearing, whatever it is, it's all in the head. The head has the responsibility of keeping the body alive. Okay? So that's that's your responsibility. Um, and then the body has needs. How do you know when you're hungry? You just know, right? How do you know when you're thirsty? You just know. It, the body, in a way we don't quite understand, is communicating to the head, we need some water. And the fingers can't go out and get water from someplace. There's no hole here, right? So it has to come from the head. Has to. Anytime I deal with marriages when, when people need help, I always concentrate first on the husband first on the husband, okay? 
So he is to he is to be since he's the head, he is to be respondent to the needs of his body. What do his what do his children need? Do, what does his family need? What does his wife need? So I learned some things about my wife. I learned that she needs somebody to listen to her. And if I don't do it, she'll find somebody else. And we had that issue come up in our marriage. And I mean, she got me. She said, you, you'll you listen to anybody in this church and they can say whatever they want to, but you don't listen to me. And boy, the God smote me with that hard. So we made an agreement that she can say whatever she wants to me. And I mean, whatever she wants to me. And we talked about it and I said, if I don't say anything, don't push, don't keep going. I heard you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about that. I'm going to pray about it. And I'm going to go talk to God. Okay. Because maybe I don't want to do what you're needing or what you're asking for. But I'm going to, I'm going to think about it and talk to God about it. And then God's going to help us. And that's, that has stopped. We haven't fought in years. I mean years. Because I started listening to her. And it's hard because sometimes I'm nodding my head, but I'm not listening. I'm thinking about somebody else, okay? But I've learned that I have to listen to her, okay? And we don't argue. I don't argue with her, okay? At times, you know, the Bible, in another verse, it says, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. So I remember one time uh, Lisa said something and it made me, it ticked me off. And I went back in my office at home and I sat down and I said, God, you told me to love my wife unconditionally. And you had told me to be not bitter against her, but I am. And God, I don't have control over my feelings. Okay. I, the feelings that come, I can't stop those. So God, I'm, I'm dealing with a little bitterness here. So God, would you either help her or help me? And that's all it took. God changed that situation around. God removed that bitterness from me. We have, it's been a long time since we went to bed not talking to each other. Long time. It's not easy, but it's the right thing to do. Okay? And those are the roles. Okay? So then, you know, the wife, you had mentioned things earlier, and I'm not going to say because we're recording, but uh, you're right. Those are the, that's the role of the woman. Think of the church now. Does the church get to tell Jesus what they want him to, what they demand him to do? No, but we can ask. And if Jesus literally came down in our church and appeared to us, I guarantee you our faces are on the ground before him, okay? That because he's our Lord. Sarah called Abraham Lord, okay? That's in the Bible. And so... The devil will work on the wife to, because she is, she is the weaker vessel, okay? God made them very weak, very beautiful, but very fragile. Reg Kelly came and said something to me that blew me away, and he preached it in a sermon here. And he said, men can handle a lot of pressure but very little pain, right? Okay, needles and all that stuff. Women can handle sickness and pain, but not much pressure. And I can always tell when my wife is under pressure, when she gets triggered by something. So the last time we met, um, or maybe the time before that, we talked about how if one, it's in Galatians 6, if anybody uh, has a problem or an issue, 
then we're to help that person with that issue to lift them back up. Okay. So that's, that's how the marriage works. You know, his weaknesses. Okay. And he's always going to have them. Always. You know, her weaknesses. She's always going to have them. Okay. And when you decide to love each other, like you do those cakes, when you decide to love each other, there is nothing that my wife can do that would make me say, I'm out of here, I'm leaving. Unconditional love. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. And loving is giving in an unconditional manner. So if I say, honey, I love you, I've learned that I'm not going to sit and wait for her to say, well, I love you too. That's not why I said it. I didn't say it to get something back. If I did, that's not real love. I said it because I really love her and I want her to know that. So whether she gives it back to me or not is, I, I, you know, that's fine. I'm going to love her unconditionally. That's because that's how Christ loves us, the church, and that's how we are to respond to him. Okay? Now, look at these papers. This teaching literally, literally saved my life. Um, not too many years after I became pastor here, um, God was just really dealing with me. And this was kind of really before, in 1997, God had me started to study the Bible, prophecy, and so on. And it, it was around that time that God was just really working in me because there was a lot of messed up stuff in me. And I remember being down at the altar one day. It was, I was by myself, and I was praying. And I said, God, I'm not a good person. I'm not... I'm not. Why did you call me? Why did you ask me to do this? Why, 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 why? Because I'm going to fail at just about everything I put my hand to. And I thought at one time that I could reach a place where sin wouldn't bother me anymore. And the Holy Ghost whispered to me, Mike, you go in seasons. You have cycles. And I believed that but I didn't have any evidence for it. And then one day, um, I had gone camping. I took a day, Lisa let me go, and I went down to St. Francis Park, and I camped out that night just by myself to get away and think. So I spent a day in the woods there at St. Francis Park, and I'm watching the big river. And God, God said to me, Mike, see that river? Said, yeah, see it? He said, which way is it flowing? And I knew what he meant. And I said, it's always going down. Rivers go down. They never go up. So the big river down there runs into, eventually, the Mississippi. Mississippi runs into the Atlantic in the Gulf of Mexico. But then what happens to it? It gets picked back up as humidity, turns into clouds, blows back over the state of Missouri, falls as rain, goes back down into the big river and then ends up back in the ocean again. And it does it and over and over and over it does this. Okay. Now there is nothing and nobody in this universe that doesn't have cycles. No, everybody has them and just about everything in the world. So look at Ecclesiastes one that they're on the page. One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. So in the process of life and death, there is there's life. That life dies, but that life has created another life, and that life is going to live, 
but then that person is going to die, but that person has created another one, and that person's going to live. And you see, from Adam, it's always gone in a cycle. Adam is still alive. Adam is still alive. In every human being on the planet, we are all of Adam. He's still alive. He's, he's still here, okay? But it went in cycles. So look at verse 5. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his, and he says the word, circuits, which is cycles. Then verse 7, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Solomon wrote this at a time when they didn't know that the ocean water was picked up by the heat of the sun and the wind and brought up into the clouds to turn into rain to fall back on the ground to go back into the ocean. Nobody knew that, but God's showing Solomon that a thousand years, three thousand years ago, Solomon figured that out. He figured out that the oceans don't get full because the water gets picked back up and turn back into the rivers again. So there, the next slide there is, you see the water cycle. Okay, now we know it, we know the science of it. Uh, I have a picture there of a galaxy. Do the stars sit in one place every night? No, they move. And if you like looking at stars, I, I know two constellations. I know the Big Dipper and I know Orion, okay? And the Pleiades, I know that one. And I know in the summertime, I can't find Orion. And in the wintertime, I can't find the Big Dipper. Okay? It's because they go in a cycle. So I know in the next winter, I'm going to be able to see Orion and the Pleiades. But right now, I can't see it. It's not there. Okay, now. Um, look at that picture there on, on uh, slide eight of that tree. Brian, what do you see there? What does that tell you? Did you ever as a kid count them? So how old is this tree? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 years old. Okay. Now look at those rings in there. By the way, time is always a circle. When he's saying in Ecclesiastes about the water cycle, going in a circle. Clocks go in a circle. The moon goes in a circle. The orbit of the earth around the sun, that's how we measure time, all goes in a circle. So here's trees. They're circular. Now, if, if you look at the rings on the tree, can you tell what years there was a lot of rain and what years there was drought? You can tell. You can tell by the width of the rings. If it's got a wide width, it means there was a lot of water that year. If it has a very small ring, it means there was drought. Sometimes you can tell that there was a fire in a certain year, okay? And it's all right there. Now, keep that in mind. And then look at Psalm 1, next page. When God showed me this, I'm telling you it literally saved my life because you said something before the recording that you don't like the fact that there are some days when you are sh straight as an arrow with the Lord, doing good, doing good at home, just, man, you're plugging it on. But then there are day days come after that where you're not, and it bothers you, doesn't it? And here's what happens. Years ago, when I would get in those places where I wasn't doing good at all, I'd think about quitting. I'm going to walk out. I can't do this. I can't pretend. I don't feel like I did three days ago. I don't feel like I did a week ago. What's wrong with me? How come I can't? live right, and stay that way. How come I can't do that? It's because of the cycles of life, okay? So think about, you know, and I'm not trying to be vulgar, but a woman's 
cycle. Women have cycles, don't they? And actually, they're related to the moon, and the word menstrual is the word moon in that word. Because it lasts 28 days, and the lunar cycle, it waxes and wanes 28 days. Okay? Now watch this. In a woman, during that period, when she gets to the place where her body is now fertile, okay, Autom things automatically kick in, okay, romance, okay, and that's natural, it's nature, God designed it that way, because your body knows that it's in a place now to where if we wanted to have a baby, now's the time to do it, okay, but once that period goes away, and think of that as the full moon time, okay, but after that time, all of a sudden, those things start fading away. The moon is now waning. It's getting smaller. It's not as bright. Most Half of it's cut off. Three quarters of it's cut off. Then you get to the point where you're going, oh, I hate this. Oh, I'm miserable. Oh, I hate everybody. Right? I mean, I'm not a woman, but I get it. Okay? And what's happening is God is, the egg is dead, okay? And it has to be cleansed. And how, again, I'm not trying to be vulgar, but how does your body cleanse that area? Blood. Everything is cleansed by the blood, okay? Okay? And then after that, the cycle starts again and you start coming back out of, when you're having that blood time, you're down in the dumps, okay? And he may be down in the dumps. The, the, more, the longer you live together, he is, without even knowing it, he is going to respond to your cycle nearly the same way you are. The longer you stay together, Believe it or not, that's how it works. So after that, you start coming back up, don't you? Things start getting better. You don't feel crummy anymore. And you start coming back to life again. Okay, now think of that tree. That tree went in that cycle every year. The tree in the springtime the tree started growing again, started getting nourishment from the sun. The leaves came out. It's ready to receive nourishment. So the waters, the sunlight, it brings it back to life. It starts growing. And then fall, what happens? It starts to die. And all winter long, no leaves, nothing, and no fruit. Now watch this. Psalm 1. And this is important, especially when it comes to addictions, because you're going you're gonna to recognize that your desire for whatever thing that you, that you are having a problem with, and I'm, I'll say this at, you know, as part of the recording, this includes drugs, this includes the prescription drugs, this includes alcohol, this includes pornography, this includes... Um, any kind of sin that we can get hooked into, that's what that includes, okay? And all of that happens in cycles. There's times when you absolutely, you're saying, you know what, I feel pretty good. I think I'm probably at a place now where I'll never want the drugs again. You ever thought that? We can have later. Where are you? Man, I wish I had, wish I could get high. Wish I could get this. Wish I could do that. Okay? And then you start thinking, man, I, I'm, it's never going to happen. I'm never, I'm never going to be right. Never going to get to this place where I'm not going to want this stuff anymore. Roy's not here, but he is our sort of hero because he's the guy that would tell you 
that for 30 some odd years, he's been dry, but he goes in cycles. And we've seen it since we started these meetings, times when he was good and times when I had to put my arm around him the other day and I, and I told him, Roy, call your sponsor. Call your sponsor, call me, call one of the persons in the group. But you got to talk, you got to talk this out. And he was in that cycle. He's not there now. He's, he's been sick. Okay. So look at Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So number one, we learn to stay away from the guys we drank with, from the people that we bought from. We learn to stay away from the parties that they're having. We learn to stay away from things on the internet. We learned, we learned those things because we're not going to do what the world is telling us to do. Nor standeth in the way of sinners, and that goes with it, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, the Bible. And in his law, the Bible, doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a what? So go back and look at that picture again. That's you. Now, first year, first two or three years of that tree's life, it's extremely vulnerable. Okay? So when, when somebody comes out of an addiction, it's like they're born again. They're starting a new life. Okay? And that time is very critical because it's like a baby. They don't have a lot of strength in them. What was I saying? Um, yeah, the tree. When that tree is small, it's very vulnerable. A wind can knock it down. Animal in the forest could push it over. Anything like that. But all of those cycles that it goes through, what's happening over time? It's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Do you see that now? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit when? In a season. Can you pick apples in January? You can't. You, can, you, can you pick apples in May? No. It's not time. Um, getting back to the woman. Can a woman just get pregnant any time she wants? No. Um, you know, I deer hunt, so I know that deer's, deer have cycles, okay? When that buck starts rubbing that velvet off his horns, he's getting ready to show those to a doe, and he's getting ready to fight another buck because he's fixing to go in rut. The doe is, about, is going into estrus, so that's the time you hunt because they're going to be on the move. They're going to be active. They're not going to be laying around, and they have that cycle one time every year. And it's just coordinated so that the deer, the baby deer is born, not in the wintertime, because it'll freeze to death. It's born near the spring, summer, when it has a chance to grow and get bigger before winter comes, put on some fat before winter comes. God designed it that way. Okay, so do I produce fruit every day in my life? Do I produce uh, the fruits of the Spirit in me, does God manifest that in me every day? Absolutely not. There are times when I'm like dead. And I've learned enough to know that it's the cycle, that eventually I will come back out of that and I'll be strong again. And every time, even when you fail, that's all part of God's working in you to strengthen you, to show you what you need to do the next time. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, I looked at that verse years ago, and I just, that verse, I was mad at God. Because it said, God, that's not, that's not right. That's not working. And God said, it's not season yet. It's not time. And a person's life will have multiple seasons of things. 
you'll have seasons of your relationship with each other. They'll be good, and then they will be strained. Um, I learned something from Bradley Crum because he was into bodybuilding. And he came in one day, he was all excited. He said, I learned something today. The way to get those big muscles is you got to get something you absolutely probably couldn't pick up and strain with everything you got to lift that up several times. And what it does, it damages the muscles. So what's the body going to do? Repair it and make them stronger. And that's how, and it worked. That's how he, I mean, he had some, he had some stuff there. Okay. So that's how God does it. Even at times when the devil is eating this all up. Okay. Did, did God let the devil take you? No. Okay. He didn't let the devil take you. He let you go through it. Even in failure, of course you can have a cake. Oh, you're just like your daddy, aren't you? Oh, okay. All right, well, go take it to her, okay? Yeah. So anyway, um, but that's how it goes. So when God started working this in me and showing it to me, then I started seeing it all through the scriptures, and I don't have time to go all through this. But in your addiction, there's going to be times when you are as strong as Superman. And somebody could walk up to you and say, hey, you got 20 bucks? And you say, look, get that stuff away from me. I don't want, I don't want that in my life anymore. Okay, and you've got the strength to do it. Okay, but understand. Understand. It's not going to last. It's not going to last. You're going to go back into a weakness state, a dormant state. Okay. And when you learn to recognize those times, then when a tree is shedding its leaves, it's almost like it's withdrawing. Okay. Paul said, I don't remember the whole verse, but when you, when you are with somebody that you know is not acting right from such withdraw thyself. Okay. So in the times when you're weak, Stay away from whoever. Stay away from whatever. Keep away from them. Withdraw. Okay? And understand that during that dormant time, it is going to get better. God's, God's going to bring you back out. Um, we'll, we'll do this and then we'll, we'll close this part. Look at Judges Chapter 3, verse 7. The children of Israel did evil in the, in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam in the groves. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Chushan, Rish, and Tham, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Chushan, Rish, and Tham for eight years. So the children of Israel is us. And we get into a cycle where our flesh doesn't want God, it wants sin. So God says, fine, and for a brief time turns us over to cruel authority, okay? And the thing that we were looking for in that addiction that we have, it wasn't there, and we're in bondage. So what happens is, look at verse, look at the next page, verse Judges 3, 9, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. So when Israel was tired of being in bondage, they cried to the Lord and God sent them someone to deliver them from that. And so now they're doing good. God's delivered them and they're going, praise the Lord, Jesus, we love you, hallelujah. We're going to serve you the rest of our life, right? 
Okay, but then look at verse 11. Next slide. The land had rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. So now they're back under cruel authority again. So then look at verse 30. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for score years. So God sent a deliverer again because they cried out to him, killed um the king of Eglin, he was, this is funny, the Bible says he was a big fat guy, and the, I can't remember the, the guy that killed him, but he had a big long dagger hidden down like this, and he made entrance into the king's chamber, and the king stuck his hand out to, to like embrace him or shake his hand, and he pulled that thing out, wham, and stuck him in the belly, and the Bible says the dirt came out. Well, you know what that is, right? That's doo-doo. Okay, and then he escaped out the window. Well, the two guards were standing out at the door, and they can smell that. They think he's in there going to the bathroom. The Bible says this. He's in there covering his feet, right? When you go to the bathroom, you cover your feet. So that's what they thought. But like after an hour, they're going, is he still sitting on that chamber pot or what? Finally, they went in there and found him dead. Okay, so... God killed their enemy, brought them back out, and they went, hallelujah, praise God, we love you, Jesus, hallelujah, we're going to serve you. So, and here's what happens. When God brings us out, he gives us, he blesses us, and he prospers us. And when we're prosperous, we don't pray as much, we don't read our Bible as much, we forget God then who shows up? Because you were saying a while ago, you heard me talk about how Jesus gave scripture to the devil and finally he left and you did that and it worked, okay? That's, your, that's the season where everything's good, a lot of leaves on the tree, the fruit's coming out, boy, I mean, you're really doing it. But then what happens is we get prideful. And in a relationship, that pride will be used, you'll use it against each other. When you're doing well, you'll pick on her or she'll pick on you. Okay? And so here, watch this. Here's what God's going to happen. You're up here. You're going to start going down. God says, I'm not going to use you. I'm not going to bless you. I'm going to start taking away your blessings. I'm going to take away your strength. And boom, I want to let some devils come and beat you up, right? Then you cry unto the Lord. What does he do? Lifts you back up. And then you get back up here again. What are you going to do? Same thing you did last time, okay? But, but over time, remember that tree, every cycle that it goes through, it's getting stronger. And stronger, stronger. And there isn't a wind, a tornado, a flood, nothing that can bring that tree down. Nothing. Okay? So, if you look, I, God showed me this years ago in the book of Judges. They went through, if I counted right, something like 15 judges. A judge would come, save them. Samson's in the book of Judges. Okay, save them, bring them out of bondage. They would say, you know, hey, we love God. We love, we're going to serve him. They would get prosperous. They would get prideful. They would forget God. Boom, back down again. Under cruel authority, God sends somebody else like Gideon. Gideon pulls them out of bondage and, and just keep going like that. And they did that 15 times in the book of Judges. They went through that cycle 15 times. Now, the thing about it is God kept sending the saviors. He never stopped because God understands this better than I do and better than you. So he knows, Brian, that maybe a week ago, two weeks ago, whatever, uh, you were really struggling. 
and God knew it and God kept you and you cried to God because I know you, you cried to God, God heard you, brought you back out and things were better. And during that whole time, you learn some things, you get wiser. I learned things with my wife, my children, because they're all grown up now and they, they're very close to us. In some ways, they were harder to deal with as adults than they were kids. And God helped me learn how to deal with my children even because of mistakes that I made with them as adults. And so I learned that because I want that great relationship with my family. There's not anything more important to me than that. My family, my God, my church, those, that's it for me. Without that, I don't have anything. So I'm willing to let God take me through those seasons. And because I know what the outcome is going to be. God's going to use the fruit that he manifests in my life to be a blessing to other people and to help plant seeds in people's life. That's what fruit does. But then I also know that that's only for a season. And then I'm not going to do that so well. You see that now. Okay. That saved my life. And I mean it literally. Because in some dark times, I don't think I was close to doing it, but you think about ending your life. I've been there. It's not a good place to be. So if it helps, if it helps you guys understand what's going on, why some days it doesn't bother you at all, and then some days it does. Just remember, cry out to the Lord. God will bring you out. Okay? God will bring you out. Are you going to make mistakes from here on out? Absolutely. And like Roy would say, if he were sitting here, he would tell us all again, don't ever think that you're not going to want to go do and use and get high, get drunk, get satisfied somehow. Don't ever think that that's not ever going to come up again because it is. Okay. Sure you do. Sure you will. Okay. But that's the time though, that you get back in the scriptures. You get back in the scriptures. See that fruit is the result of what that tree worked for all year long. Even in the dormant season, it was it shed its leaves because it's protecting itself. Okay? And then springtime, it's gaining nourishment, it's getting all the sunlight that it needs through the leaves, and it's doing it all for that fruit. Okay? Because that fruit is the most important thing to that tree. Nothing else matters but bearing that fruit. What does Jesus do to a tree that doesn't produce fruit? Cuts down, casts in the fire. Okay. So, like I say, if this helps you guys and it helps anybody else, if I can get these two videos stitched together, then that will be a blessing to me so that you guys understand you're never, ever, ever going to reach this plateau where you're going to stay there until Jesus comes. It's not going to happen. Okay, but when you get down there, get in the word, get on your knees, sun will come back up again. It always has and it always will. Okay, so uh, I know I don't have a lot of explanations on these pages, but read through these scriptures because I show I take that water cycle and I show you how that's all a picture of us. Okay, like. 
when we get lifted up out of the, the ocean's deep, the ocean's a picture of hell. Salt water's a picture of fire in the Bible. And we're down in the deepest hell. And yet God lifts us back up again. And now we're up in the sky, right? We're big lofty clouds. But we're like high and mighty people. And we think we're better than everybody else. And God can't use us. We're clouds without water, the Bible says. So God starts bringing tears to our eyes. And the Bible says that let my tears drop as rain. So which way does the rain go? Down. But what is it doing? It's blessing everybody else's life. See it? Your weaknesses and your tears end up being a blessing for everybody else's life. And God's using you. Okay? But then, boom, you're back down there again. But what's God going to do? He's going to lift you back up again. And he's never going to fail that ever until we all get to heaven and then there'll be no more cycles. Okay? So just keep that in your mind. Put that in your heart. And the next time you're really struggling, get in the word and remind yourself, this is going to pass. It's not going to stay this way forever. Okay? Let's go to prayer. Father, I love you. Thank you, Father, for showing me how my life is. And you know, God, that when you taught me this, I was not at my best. And God, you loved me anyway, unconditionally. And you knew the plan that you were going to work in my life. You knew, God, that everything that had happened was part of your plan to teach me, to train me, so that you could nurture me and build me up so that you could use me to, to bring forth fruit for your kingdom. And Father, I have a lot of regrets. But when I look back, I understand, God, that you did all that for a reason. And Father, I still have the messenger of Satan to buffet me. I still have those thorns in my flesh, and so do these guys. But Father, we know, God, that that's only for a season, and joy will come in the morning. That's what your Bible says. You said in Lamentations that your mercy and your love for us is new every single day, like a cycle. So, Father, teach us this and help us, dear God, in our weakest times and times where we're not doing good. Maybe times, God, where we, where we slip up. Go back to an addiction. God, we know, Father, that you'll chasten us because you love us. And you'll use that incident, God, for the next time it comes up. We won't go back over there. We won't do those things. We'll stay away from it. So, Father, bless us and open our eyes and open our hearts, dear God. And renew, Father, this teaching in my heart. Help me to see it. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name.